the Navier-Stokes equation are the fundamental description of fluid motion. In order to solve them with the finite element method in Phoenix, we have to apply a projection method in order to enforce the incompressibility. Then we have to derive weak forms for all intermediate steps. Let's do that in detail. Welcome to this new video. As said in the intro, the weak form is fundamental in order to solve problems with the finite element method. Once we have obtained this weak form, we can hand it over to the Phoenix finite element library and solve it within Python. The way towards the weak form can be a bit challenging, especially since we also have to apply a projection method in order to enforce our incompressibility, here we're going to use Corin's projection method. But please bear with me, I want to explain all the steps in great detail. And as a simplified example, I want to look at the lid-driven cavity scenario, as I've also done in the previous video, where we coded a simple Navier-Stokes solver already with the weak forms being derived. And in order to comply with this lid-driven cavity, I just want to add initial and boundary conditions. So for the boundary condition, I want to mimic the lid-driven cavity Cavity, then our velocity is zero everywhere except on the top. So on the top, so on the top there, it was like um, that we had a U which pointed with one in X direction and zero in Y direction. And then for the initial condition, I want to set the velocity field to zero. So U at T equals zero and all position X shall be the zero vector. Although we are considering this particular video for the lid-driven cavity scenario, it can also be applied to almost any Navier-Stokes problem since the steps are mostly the same. And for the agenda of the video, I first want to look at Corin's projection method in the strong form, so in this PDE level form as we see it here. And then we will derive three substeps of the core and projection method. And for all of the three substeps, we have to then derive the weak form. And in the end, I will do a quick summary. So let's first look into Corin's method. So let's look at Corin's projection method. And the idea of Corin's projection method is to look at all the components in the momentum equation individually. And I just want to write them down here. So we will have an transient term, which is the temporal derivative, then plus a convection term. On the right hand side we will have a pressure gradient and then we will have a diffusion term. And theoretically we would also have a forcing term, so there could be a plus f here, but I won't consider it here in the video. Well, and if we look at it, there is only one term which has a temporal derivative, which is of course the transient term. And if we rearrange for this one, then we will get that du by dt is minus convection plus pressure gradient plus diffusion. And now the idea is to treat this as an ordinary differential equation and the right hand side as certain operators which we can split. By this we want to apply convection, pressure gradient and diffusion individually instead of all at the same time. So we're going to introduce a discretization of temporal derivative here. So we will have a u at time step t plus 1, so at the next time, minus u at the current time, divided by a delta t, so a time step length, is equal to this right hand side, so minus convection plus pressure gradient plus diffusion. And now Corin proposed that we will leave out the pressure gradient and perform an intermediate step until a u star and then do another temporal step from the u star to u t plus one, but just with the gradient. So what he said is that we will set this one to zero in the first step and then introduce a star here and then get another step which goes from u star to u t plus one. Okay, let's write that down. So first we will have one from u star minus u t with u being the value from the previous iteration in time, or if we are in the zero of iteration, this is just the initial condition, divided by the delta t is equal to minus convection plus diffusion. And then we will have another step, which we will do from u t plus one minus u star divided by delta t is the pressure gradient. 
And this is nothing else than an operator splitting, if you've heard this before. So this is an operator splitting. Okay, let's take the actual mathematical descriptions of convection diffusion and pressure gradient in order to write down an algorithm. So let's have step number one, which would be u star minus u at t divided by delta t. Well, this hasn't changed, right? But the right-hand side for the convection, we will then have first our velocity u dot product with the Nabla operator, and then this one applied to u, plus nu times the Laplace operator applied to u. And of course, we get a negative sign here since we have the negative convection. But since we already made a temporal discretization, so in a sense, we have introduced a, a discretization of the temporal derivative, we also have to assign time values to u because on the left hand side we now have u at two different time steps so at the previous iteration in time which i denoted t as well as this intermediate tentative velocity time step which i denoted star and now you have to think of it more generally in terms of advection diffusion equations in which we want to set certain components to be treated explicitly and some are treated implicitly. And I think probably the easiest choice here also with respect to the stability constraints is to set the convection to be fully explicit. So we will have a fully explicit convection and that means we will take u's from the previous iteration in time. So at u t and in contrast we will have a fully implicit diffusion so fully implicit diffusion because due to the second derivative here on the diffusion the stability constraint is usually higher and if we took it explicitly we might have to use smaller time steps whereas usually the stability constraint on an explicit convection step is a little looser so we will select this one at index star, which is at this intermediate time step. Okay, that's step number one. Then we will have step number two. I want to skip for a second and just directly go to step number three. And step number three is this second step we have here. So we will say that u at t plus one minus u star divided by delta t is the pressure gradient. And the pressure gradient was minus nabla p and here we also have to ask the question at which time level do we want to have p do we want it to have at this intermediate star do we want it to have it at t plus one i mean you could think of it as the pressure at t plus one but loosely speaking it does not matter here so you can have it either implicit or explicit so implicit explicit does not matter here. So it is just the pressure that is associated with this time step and it does not matter whether we would consider it at this intermediate star or at t plus one. And now we might have to look at it a little bit from an implementation perspective. So step number one is something that you could solve, right? So, so far we haven't talked about finite element methods and weak forms, but you could also apply a finite difference discretization and just solve for the u star. So maybe let me also note this down. So this is an equation where we have to solve for u star. This u star is a component which is not incompressible because if we look at the Navier-Stokes equation, mathematically speaking, the pressure gradient in a Navier-Stokes equation is enforcing the incompressibility. But since we left it out, the velocity we will get after the step is no longer incompressible. And that's also the reason we do this third step in order to ensure incompressibility. Well, this is something where we have to solve for u t plus one, but this leaves the question like, how do we obtain the p? So we need the p in order to ensure incompressibility, but we don't have it. So the second step naturally will be to obtain the pressure but of course how are we going to do that so this will be the next step i just want to leave one remark here um i don't have the one over row here anymore so the one that you see here and this is just for simplicity i want to note that down here i will consider row to be one here in order to make the derivations a little bit easier and i also see that there shouldn't be an underscore here because 
in the second equation, this incompressibility constraint, we have the divergence of the velocity, which gives us a scalar, so we don't have an underscore, whereas technically we would need an underscore here for the hypothetical forcing function. Well, but back to the actual problem, so let's go down and try to find a way how to obtain the pressure. And the idea that Corin proposed is to take the divergence of this third step. So we will find the pressure equation and it will be a Poisson equation. And we will also see that in a second. So the pressure Poisson problem and we will find it by taking the divergence of the update equation and the update equation was equation number three. So the update equation number three. So this one here. So what we're going to do is we take the divergence of the left hand side as well as the divergence of the right hand side. So on the left hand side we had this fraction. So let me put it separately. So we will have a u at t plus one divided by delta t minus a u star divided by delta t. And of course we had the equal sign. And on the right hand side we had minus gradient of p at t plus one. Well, as said, let's ignore the time step. So we will just have it as p. Okay, let's apply the divergence to all the components here. So we'll first have the divergence of u at the next time step divided by delta t minus the divergence of our tentative step that was not incompressible divided by delta t. And on the right hand side, we have minus the Laplace operator on p. And I hope this makes sense because the divergence of the gradient is the Laplace operator. Okay, let's look at the left hand side. So we have the divergence of the velocity at the next time step and the divergence of the velocities at a tentative intermediate time step. The idea is that if we have a correct update step in free, the velocity at the next time step should be incompressible, right? Because that's actually what we want to achieve with equation number three. And, and the property of an incompressible fluid is that the divergence is zero. So this one will be zero. And that is because the velocity at next time step is incompressible. And of course, this one is not. So in total, we are getting the following equation. So we have minus divergence of u star divided by delta t is minus Laplace operator on p. Well, let's remove the minus signs and maybe also bring the Laplace operator on p to the left hand side. So we get Laplace on p is one over delta t times the divergence of our tentative velocity step. And I hope you now see that this is a Poisson equation because it is an equation for the pressure. So since we already obtained u star from the tentative velocity step, we now solve this with a fixed right hand side. So we obtain the u star, take the divergence, this is our right hand side. And in a sense, if a velocity field is not divergence free, and in a sense it's compressible, this is kind of the defect. So it's the defect of incompressibility. So it shows us where there are spots in our velocity field or a vector field which has either sources or sinks and then matches a pressure field in order to circumvent those or to fix these. Okay, let's put these steps together again. In summary, we will have the following three steps. So the first steps, or maybe let me also add, this is the summary for Corin's projection in strong form. So Corin's projection in strong form. And also quite crucially, we already have decided which parts are explicit and implicit. If you want to do this differently, then of course, this is also the step where you might have to change some indices. So step number one, which was u star minus ut divided by delta t is equal to minus u at t dot product with the NAPLA operator applied to ut plus new times the plus operator applied to u star. And I want to call this the tentative momentum step. So the tentative momentum step. So we will solve the momentum equation, but without the pressure gradient, because we don't have the pressure yet. So we will do step number two then, which is the pressure Poisson problem. So Laplace operator on P is equal to one over delta T times the divergence of U star. 
and asset. This shall be our pressure Poisson problem. And then we have step number three, which will be u at time step t plus one minus u tentative divided by delta t is equal to minus gradient on the pressure that we just obtained in step number two. And this is the velocity correction, or you might also call it a projection step. In, in a mathematical speaking, we are projecting the velocity function into a function space that is incompressible. But technically, here we're just like having a simple Euler discretization of another step. And the right hand side, this gradient of p is given since the p is known from step number two. And that's it, what we're going to do in the strong forms. And the next step is to derive the weak form for all three equations. So that's what we're going to do now. So now we were going to find the weak forms to all three equations. Then let's kick it off with the tentative momentum step. So this will be equation one, the tentative momentum step and we will do the usual three-step process in order to obtain a weak form. So step number one is to multiply with a test function and in order to get the correct test function we have to look at the primary unknown and the primary unknown is the u star which we see here and here and this one is a three-dimensional or two-dimensional vector field so the test function will also be a vector field so the test function i want to call v and this one is either two or three dimensional vector field. And then we also have to ensure a contraction down to scalar. And since this is a vector valued equation, so we have vector entries on both left and right hand side, we have to make an inner product with the test function or scalar product in order to contract down to scalar. So that results in u star minus u at t over delta t in brackets transpose times vector v is equal to minus and then opening bracket and another opening bracket for u at t from the previous step in time dot product with the Napla operator and then with u t and then in brackets transpose with v and that's of course the scalar product in a product plus and then we have new Laplace operator on u star with v and of course a transpose here. Next step in our three step process is to integrate or an integration over the domain omega and of course this domain depends on the simulation you're looking at. In the case of the lid driven cavity that was the unit square domain. So on the left hand side we're getting the integral over omega of well this expression so u star minus u at t divided by delta t in brackets transpose times v over the volume so dv a capital v don't confuse the capital v with the lowercase one the, here the lowercase one is also a vector field so that should be yeah a little bit of a distinguishing factor and that one is equal to minus integral over omega and then this expression exactly so let's have the open bracket and then another one for u at t dot product Napla operator u at t close transpose v over the volume and then plus integral over omega and then here we have the new Laplace operator on u star inner product with v integrated over the volume. And the last step in the weak form derivation is to have an integration by parts. And for this we have to take a sharp look because usually we're doing this integration by parts in order to get rid of higher order derivatives or spatial derivatives to be precise. And if we look at our description we see on the left hand side we don't have any spatial derivatives. And then in the convection term we have one spatial derivative that is indicated by the Napla operator. And if we look at the diffusion term we have two spatial or second order spatial derivatives by the Laplace operator. So since we want to have at max one spatial derivative, at least for the particular PDEs we're looking at here, this will be our candidate for the integration by parts. And in essence, the idea in integration by parts is to move one order of differentiation over to the test function. So I will just highlight this. So we will do it only for this part. So only 
here the other integrals will stay the same so let's look at this one so we have the following integral so it will be integral over omega and i will also leave out the new and I'll remove the star for a second so because that does not greatly change what we're going to do here so it will be laplace on u in brackets transpose v over the volume and this is a really typical problem i mean if you have not seen that before then probably don't think so but this is a typical problem in those weak form derivations so i just want to note that down this is a typical problem it is the weak form of the laplace operator and i have another video where i derived this with the heat equation for a scalar field also take a look there if you want more details but i will also try to do it in great detail here and the problem with the vector valued Laplace operator, so in other words, a Laplace operator applied to a vector field, which gives another vector field, is that when we use the symbolic notation, so the notation you see here with the Napla and the Laplace, it can become a little bit tedious. So it's actually reasonable to change to index notation. So for this, I want to go to index notation and also just want to have um, the inner parts of the integrand and if we write this one down we get that we have the second derivative of a vector field so we have a component ui which is derived two times with respect to xj and another one with xj and this index notation is using the so-called einstein summation convention and according to this convention whenever there is an index appearing twice in a multiplicative scenario sum over all the components so in that particular case let's say we have the j our index and this j runs in a two-dimensional case uh, we have one and two and in a three-dimensional case we have one to three then this is basically a summation over the second derivatives of each of the components in u and then this result is scalar multiplied with the test function and this refers to an inner product with vi and so we also have a contraction of the i index and the reason I'm doing this is because I now want to use the reverse product rule in order to come up with an equivalent expression of this one, where we have one order of spatial derivative moved over to the test function. So let's now do the reverse product rule. And that sounds quite crazy. I have another video linked up here where I also used the reverse product rule, but in symbolic notation as well. So if you are stuck at this place, take a look at this video as well. So for the reverse product rule, we will come up with a hypothetical expression, which we derive with the help of the product rule. And then in the components that are created by the product rule, we will then identify this expression. Okay, this sounds crazy. Let's just do it. So let's assume we have the following expression, which is dui by dxj multiplied with vi. So instead of a second derivative, we only have a first derivative. And then we apply another derivative with respect to xj. And then by the product rule, we will first propagate the derivative to the first component in the product and then to the second. So that's the first which gives us the second derivative of ui with respect to xj and xj times vi plus and then dui with dxj times dvi with respect to dxj. And now we see that this was exactly what we had prior. And I just want to rewrite this in symbolic notation as well. So let's have that one in symbolic notation or with um, NAPLA operators. And then this one would refer to an divergence of the gradient on U times V is equal to, here we had the Laplace operator on U transpose times V plus the gradient of U double contracted with the gradient on V. I hope you now see why I prefer the index notation in these higher tensorical scenarios because it is not quite obvious to me that this is the product rule to this expression. And also if you have never seen these colon operator, that means element-wise multiplication of matrices and then summing all the entries. So if you have, for instance, a two by two matrix, then you multiply the top left entry with the top left entry of the other matrix plus the top right entry with the top right entry and so on and so forth. Same 
as an inner product for vectors, it's the inner product for matrices. And here we also see that expression again. And recall that is exactly what we had here. So let's just rearrange for this. So let's rearrange for this. And then we get the expression that the Laplace operator on U transpose with V is equal to, well, this expression. So the divergence of the gradient on U times V minus the gradient on U double contracted with the gradient on V. And I'm sorry, this is a little bit, yeah, this is probably a better V here. And now let us plug this expression back into the integral. So back into the integral. And then we get that new, and here I want to go back to the one that we see here. So where we have the new, the kinematic viscosity together with the U star as the tentative element. So we have new times the integral over omega of the Laplace operator on U star in brackets transpose times V integrated over the volume is equal to, and I'm just like replacing this here. So the integral over omega of the divergence of the gradient on U multiplied with V and then integration over omega minus integration over omega of gradient of u star and here we also need the star and then double contracted with the gradient on v integrated over the volume and now we see that we have done the integration by parts almost because we have moved one order of spatial derivative over to v at least in the second integral but now we also have a divergence integral where we technically still have two derivatives however we can apply the Gaussian or divergence theorem. So Gauss or divergence theorem. And that one tells us that if we have a divergence over a field in our domain or integrated over the domain, this is equal to a surface integral of the quantity dotted with the outward facing unit normal. So this one is equivalent to new of course we see, of course I forgot the news here. So let me plug them in here. But uh, nevertheless, so we are getting new times the integral over d omega, which is the surface of our domain. And for the lid driven cavity, that would be the four faces or the four edges of the domain of the outward facing unit normal vector transpose or in an inner product with the gradient of u star times v integrated over the surface. And since we now have pure Dirichlet boundary conditions in the Littreven cavity scenario, so that one was here, like the BCs. And of course, this means everywhere on the domain boundary. So everywhere on domain boundary, just to be precise, um, except for the top. But um, this just means it's Dirichlet. Some For three edges, it's homogeneous Dirichlet, and one is an inhomogeneous Dirichlet. And then our test function has to be compact on the boundary. So in other words, it will be zero on the boundary. So we will see that the test function is zero on the boundary. And then this entire integral will evaluate to zero. And then we have found the weak form to our tentative momentum step. And there were quite some steps, so let me quickly recap. So we now have an expression for the integration by parts of the implicit diffusion, which is equal to that one here. And now we can replace it here and then just have this one as our weak form. Okay, so let me note that down. So this will be the weak form of the tentative momentum step. So we're going to have the integral over omega. So I will just uh, copy that down. So we have u star minus u at t divided by delta t, and then in brackets transpose with the test function v integrated over the volume of the domain is equal to minus the integral over omega of the gradient of u at t applied to u and then the result in brackets transpose with v inner product 
And now the result from our integration by parts, and we have to be careful, it's a minus sign now, similar to the integration by parts in one dimensions where the part where we have actually moved the derivative over will also get a negative sign in front. So we will get minus integration over omega and let's have our constitutive parameter, the kinematic viscosity nu here as well. And then we have the gradient, also underscore here, gradient of u star double contracted with the gradient of v and then integrated over the volume. And that's our first equation. Let's continue with the pressure Poisson problem. So equation number two, the pressure Poisson problem. And the steps towards the weak form will be identically the same. So we will have step number one, multiply with test function. And the test function, well, let's look at the strong form equation again. Here we have an equation which is in terms of P, the pressure field, which is a scalar. And since P is a different unknown than the U star, we also have a different test function. So the test function has to be compatible with the primary unknown. So we will call it Q here and it's a scalar test function. And be advised because we are using this as the second step, we have information on the U star from the tentative momentum step. So this is just a constant right hand side. So in speaking in terms of the PDE, it will be constant. Okay, so let's multiply with the test function Q. So let me note that down, multiply with test function Q. Then we get the Laplace operator on P multiplied with Q. And since we only have a scalar components here, we could have also directly multiplied them. And then we have on the right hand side, one over delta T multiplied with the divergence of our tentative velocity field multiplied with the test function Q. Then step number two is to integrate over the domain. So integrate over the domain and then we will get the integral over omega and the left hand side will just be Q times Laplace on P, just change the order here, integrated over the volume and the right hand side will be the integration over omega of one over delta t with the divergence of u star and then q integrated over the volume. And then we have another integration by parts, so integration by parts. And I hope by now that you see that the weak form of the Laplace operator is a standard problem. So you will mostly encounter this. And in the simplest case here, this will just translate into the inner product of the gradient of the test function with the gradient on P. Here is just a vector inner product because of course the gradient of a scalar field is a vector and then the inner product for two vectors is the dot product. Whereas in the previous case we had it that um, the gradient, where is it here it is, so the gradient is a matrix, so we needed the colon for the double contraction. Okay, but here this will just result in minus and the negative sign is also crucial, integration over omega, gradient of P in brackets transpose with gradient on Q. So it's just the inner product integrated over the volume. The right hand side will stay the same, so integration over omega, one over delta t, and then we have the divergence of u star times q over the volume. And this is already our final weak form. So this is the final weak form. And so we're already done with the pressure Poisson problem. Let's go on with the last one, which will be the velocity update step. So the velocity update step. And also here, same steps, step number one, will to be multiply with test function. And let's look at the strong form again. So the test function, of course, as said, matches the primary unknown. And here the primary unknown is u at t plus one. So it will be another vector field. But since it will be of the same form as the u star, we can say that u star and u at t plus one, they come from the same function space. And so we can use the same test function. So here we will also use the V test function. And if you watch the video with the implementation, that's also what we've done with Phoenix. And that is because in that sense, 
test function and also trial functions are just concepts in order to translate a weak form and they are not actual functions in that sense. Okay, so let's use the test function v here. Let me go down again and say this will be with test function v. And then of course we will get u at t plus one minus u star divided by delta t in brackets transpose times v is minus the gradient on p transpose with v. And then step number two will be an integration over the domain. So integration over domain. And then, I mean, it is just a copy paste action. So integration over omega. And then we have u at the next time step minus u star divided by our time step length in brackets transpose times test function v integrated over the volume capital V and then integration over omega of minus gradient on P in brackets transpose times V over the volume. And then last step will be to have our integration by parts, integration by parts. And for this, let us recall again, why did we do that? Because we wanted to reduce the order of spatial derivatives on the primary unknown. But since there is no spatial derivative on the primary unknown, this one is actually not necessary. So this is not a necessary step. So this one is not necessary. And as a consequence, this one is already our final weak form. So the final weak form. Let's use all the weak forms to make a summary. And this is also the recipe that was used in the Phoenix implementation. So for the tentative momentum step, so tentative momentum step, I also want to use a notation from mathematics here, which is using these angular brackets in order to denote an inner product. And inner products are of various kinds. You can have inner products of vectors as we've seen here, but this will be in terms of a functional inner product. And the functional inner product is defined as the scalar contraction integrated over the domain omega. So in our case, well, if we look at the weak form that we found, we have the scalar contraction of u star minus ut and v on the left hand side. So here we will have u star minus u from the previous step and v. And I just want to put the one over delta t in front of that. Let me also put it into a residuum form so that we have zero on the left hand side. And that is commonly done in these momentum steps because there are some more options on how to discretize your convection step. And as a consequence, if we then look again here, we see if we moved all these parts from the right hand side to the left hand side, their sign would swap. So instead of a minus, there would be a plus on both the convection as well as the weak diffusion. If we just had a strong diffusion, it would be positive, but the weak diffusion here is negative, but it gets positive again once we move it to the left hand side. Okay, let's do that. So we will get plus, and then here we will have the gradient on u at time step t multiplied with u at time step t and v, and then the inner product closed, and plus. And then finally, we have our diffusion. So this one is that expression here. So it will be the inner product of the gradients. So in other words, these two matrices. So gradient of u star and gradient of v. So we will get inner product of gradient of u star and gradient of v. And then all of that is multiplied with new the kinematic viscosity. Okay, step number two is the pressure Poisson problem. And also as a side note, usually in many Navier-Stokes problems, the pressure Poisson problem is going to be the toughest one to solve and also the one which probably takes the most care in order to find good preconditioners. But this just as a side note. And here I want to have it in left-hand side and right-hand side fashion. So left-hand side is gradient on P with gradient on Q in the functional inner product is minus one divided by delta t of the functional inner product of the 
divergence of the tentative step, so the defect, so by how much our fluid is not incompressible, because if it was already incompressible, that would be zero. So we will be solving a problem with a zero right-hand side. And then the Q function, the test function for the pressure field. And then last step, which is the velocity correction, or you might also call it projection. And here we will have, and I just want to have it a little bit spread out. So the left-hand side will be U at T plus one, and then we have the V test function, and the right-hand side will be U star and V star, and then minus delta T gradient of P and V. And then let's also add for what we are solving these equations. So this is an equation for U star, and you find it here and here. This is an equation for P, which you will find here. And this is an equation for U t plus one, which of course is here. And then this is just an iterative procedure. Once we have found t plus one, we go back to step one, la 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 la, and so on and so forth. And there we get our transient simulation. You will find the PDF to this handwritten notes if you want to go over it again with a download link in the video description. A big thanks to all the Patreons of the channel. If you also want to support my vision of free education on these advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. There are more tutorials like this, more on finite element method, more on Phoenix. I'm pretty sure you will find something that you will enjoy here. Here you will now see similar videos and I hope to see you in one of the next videos.